the challenge, the opportunity to connect. The 1960s, a time of imagination and change, a time of anger and fear. The 1960s, a program called Challenge. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Looked at our connections, our divisions, through the lens of faith. Nearly 60 years later, during these challenging times, we'll take a new look at our divisions, our connections, in a new program called Challenge 2.0. During the last two episodes of Challenge 2.0, we focused on the most negative aspects of masculinity, arrogance, violence, misogyny. Historian and author Ruth ben Giat shared how that has led to the rise of strong men, dictatorships, the damage of democracy, and the fraying of societies and families. Then we visited with the visionary founders of a project to help men and women reconcile with each other and reimagine constructive ways to relate, Will Keepen and Cynthia Bricks. This week, we seek to close that circle to examine how faith traditions have contributed to a destructive version of masculinity, but also how those same traditions can offer guidance for a constructive way forward. So I'm delighted to welcome guests who have been on this program before, and I'm very grateful that they've returned to be uh, a part of this conversation and to guide this discussion. We have with us Rabbi Ted Falcon, Pastor Don McKenzie, and Imam Jamal Rahman, all of the Interfaith Amigos. Thank you so much for joining us again today. It's our, it's our yeah, pleasure. It is. Delight. We're looking at the topic of patriarchy, the male dominance of society. And I think this is often viewed as being rooted in faith traditions, particularly in the three Abrahamic faiths, which each of you represent, uh, Christianity, Judaism, and uh, also Islam. Is that a fair assessment or was there more at play in this process? You know, uh, Jeff, I think it's an excellent question. And I also think it's a critical issue for us to be looking at. It's interesting, as we have been working, the three of us have been working together as uh, interfaith amigos for almost 20 years. And it's frequently come to our awareness that had we really known when when we began that we would be working together you know because we didn't really have this in mind when we started uh in in kind of commemoration of the first anniversary of 9 11. Mm -hmm. um one of us would have been a woman i guess at least one of us would have been a woman um, and although this is an issue that we encounter and speak to often, you showed, well, one of our books called Religion Gone Astray really identifies one of the ways our religions have gone astray is promoting the inequality of men and women. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think it's important to, to know that, A, we are aware of that, you know, B, we're aware of the problem of being three men, really not representing half of the population of the world. Um, and being three men who are representatives of religious traditions that have become identified. And I think rightly so, with patriarchy uh, and with the terrible pain that patriarchy has brought upon the major part of the world population, you know, and although it expresses in different places culturally, there's no question, there's no question the institutions of patriarchy are clearly supported in um, in our traditional literature. Uh, I don't think there's any way around that. And I think as we get into this discussion, we will be talking about some of the ways in which we perceive that in each of our traditions. And of course, the <clears throat> each of our traditions 
came to be during a time of patriarchy. I mean, it was that was just the way that was it, patriarchy was a way of being uh, at the time. Uh, and I think there are aspects of each of our traditions that push against that, but nonetheless, they are, they are rooted in patriarchy. Now, one of the things that we have been moved to say periodically in our presentations is that just simply an acknowledgement, as Rabbi Ted said, that we are three men. And so that provides a challenge, has provided a challenge for us to keep in mind a feminine sensibility as we move forward and, and talk about uh, our findings and so forth and invite people to think about these things. But we've also noted that the willingness to be as vulnerable as the three of us, each of the three of us has needed to be in our relationship is not a masculine thing. It's, it's more a feminine, it's more that rooted in a feminine sensibility. And so in some ways, even though we physically don't represent half the world, we have had an experience that at least has invited us into more of a balance, which is what we would promote, a balance of masculine and feminine ways of understanding experience. Because right now we're still deeply embedded in um, and unrestrained masculinity, a patriarchy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's partly uh, what's at the root of so much of the polarization. And if I may just add to that, if we look at all of our three traditions, the description of God is always in the male pronoun, mm -hmm. notwithstanding even what we call the grammatical uh, gender. That's number one. All the major prophets have been men. I mean, you know, the, uh, the in, in Sufism, in mystical Islam, some men uh, tease the women, you know, that the crown of prophethood has always been placed on the heads of men. The belt of nobility has always been tied around the uh, waist of men. Is God patriarchal? But you see, we forget that, as the mystics say, it is the wombs of the women that gave birth to the prophets. That's why in the Quran, you have several times this uh, very sacred verse that says, revere Allah. And immediately after that is the verse that says, revere the wombs that bore you. Uh, point number three, none of our holy books come with uh, footnotes. And sadly, we, we fight over the interpretation and it's almost always what, uh, you know, Sufi mystics call, and this is for all the three traditions, it's the bearded assembly that does the interpretation, not the women, mm -hmm. uh, for centuries. And so they all veered towards being in favor of men. So these uh, uh, biases, they contribute to the distortion and dysfunction. We're going to talk a little bit more about how that's changing and how it might change, but uh, did this patriarchal structure, this emphasis, flow strictly out of holy scriptures of each of your faiths, or was it also the result of the cultures that existed at the time they arose? I think in many ways there, the scripture is a reflection of the times in which it was written. You know, no matter how we understand revelation or the um, opening to a fuller, more inclusive, more universal spiritual wisdom, still gets translated through human beings mm -hmm. and it still gets put into words. And, uh, and we can see actually levels of how how it kind of happened or when it happened. You know, in the book of Genesis, uh, Bereshit, it's called in Hebrew, um, there are actually three creation stories, three stories of the creation of human beings. Both the first and the third have male and female created together 
and their name is Adam. Now, Adam, which is a, a form of, is taken from the Hebrew word Adama, which means earth. Adam means human being, not it was not originally a name. Mm -hmm. It was not a name, Adam, in the fifth chapter of the book of Breshit. It says clearly, simply, God, God created male and female and called their name Adam. The second story has this story of a confusion, you know, where all of a sudden it looks like a male was created first, and then from the male comes a female, which is physiologically exactly the opposite of what actually happens. Mm. And that, you know, where where we have the woman perceived as um, taking the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was not to be eaten, lest you become human, um, that kind of reflects a shift and has supported, you know, from the, from the very beginning, a, a, a kind of, a, a, a way of looking at men and women, which has been incredibly unfortunate. Mm -hmm. um, part of it is a problem of translation because the name that the man gives his wife as they're uh, leaving the garden, in other words, as they're becoming human, um, is Chava, which means life. He turns to her and he says, therefore your name is life because you're the mother of all the living. And somehow, instead of that getting translated as your name is life, it gets translated your name is Eve. There's no Eve. That's a that's a, a translation. Um, it's not what the Hebrew says. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to acknowledge that we are heirs to an extremely patriarchal system uh, that needs remediation. That, I think, leads to the question, has patriarchy, male domination of society, always been the pattern as we look back across centuries and millennia? or were there different emphases, different arrangements? Right, and a very important question. I think this is a great follow-up to uh, what Rabbi Ted has just said, that prior to patriarchy, there was there's considerable archeological evidence having come to light in the last hundred years to show that prior to the worship of the male deity, there was a feminine sensibility at work worshiping the feminine. Um, but that reality has been censored by male archaeologists, by patriarchy, and so we didn't know about that, except the word goddess was sort of thrown about loosely as something silly or stupid or, you know, whatever. And, and I think that the, it's a possibility that that middle creation story that Rabbi Ted mentioned, where Eve is shown to be lesser than uh, the man, is an, a reflection, as Ted said, I think that's the word you used, Ted, a reflection of that censorship and that need to show that men are superior to women. And that has been, you know, for Christianity, that's been the, the, the prevailing sense until recently, until Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique, 1980, uh, 1964, I see the story of Mary Magdalene as something pushing back against um, this extreme patriarchy. I mean, she is one of the wisest people in the stories. Um, for me also, I'd say the story of Ruth in Hebrew scripture and her willingness to follow her mother-in-law instead of returning as patriarchy would suggest to her homeland when her husband dies is another example of devotion to a cause that becomes, for me, a precursor to the life and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say there's a beautiful story in the Islamic spiritual literature about how man becomes jealous of woman. In fact, even God becomes jealous. I mean, it's part of the story. Uh, is it, I'll say it very briefly. You know, when God created humanity 
and you know, seven to eight billion people, God said, how can I be present with each one of them at the same time? Ah, God thought of this idea, I'll create women who will give birth and who will take care of the children. So everybody said, this is such a fantastic idea God had. But the Sufis say, that's not the end of the story. You see, because it was the magic, it was the province of God to offer the blessing of unconditional love. But the woman began to give it to you know, her children or other children. That's called muhabbat. It was the province of God to give hifazat, devotion. Women began to give that. It was the province of God to give barkat, blessings. The woman began to give that. God said, what have I done? Because God has become sort of secondary to the woman who has become parvardigar. In Persian, that means divine. And God said, oh my, my, I have become beruzgar. Be means without, ruzgar means livelihood. I have been, I've become without a source of livelihood. So out of this beauty of the creation of women and the magic of the womb and this creative principle of giving birth and be giving love, giving devotion, giving, giving blessings, man became jealous of the powers of women. That's the source mm -hmm of patriarchy. When we look at that imbalance, what damage does that do to our ability to more fully grow in our faith and experience our faith and live it out? It's really, it's really challenging. You know, I hear uh, Imam Jamal's uh, story and it's a lovely story, but it's also a, a really problematic story because it defines a woman's role from a masculine standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, it is an interesting phenomenon to look at the world today and to notice the difference between countries that have women as their leaders versus countries that have men as their leaders. The countries that have women as their leaders do not see women as wombs. It's not that women don't have wombs. It's not that m most women might have children. It's just that women are so much more than that, you know, just as a man is so much more than a father or a depositor of semen. Um, sexuality, family is certainly an aspect mm -hmm. of our lives. There were cultures where it was the men who took care of the children. Uh, there were cultures where the spirituality was clearly uh, transmitted through women. Uh, I mean, there's just no question about this, as Pastor Don was saying, you know, archaeologically. And I mean, we are understanding, we are seeing evidences of that reflected, you know, in the early confrontations as patriarchy kind of assumed ascendancy. I, I, you know, when you ask about the impact and the effects of this patriarchal support for the patriarchal system, I think it's insidious. I, I think we're not, we, those of us who read scripture are often not even aware. An example of that, I mean, the word awareness is key, I would say that uh, it's a word that Jamal and Ted have helped me to understand. Um, for me, for example, reading scriptures where the words the Jews have been used, I, I you know, I read that and I thought I didn't, it's just like when Ted said he didn't under, he didn't think anything about it when he would read that was God as masculine and so forth. And what I did have a translation of the Bible that used the words religious authorities, where often the Jews, but those gospels were written at a time when the Jews were seen to be the enemies of Christianity in the early part. And it's a strong part of the source of anti-Semitism, a very strong part. And I didn't even, I mean, I knew it and I didn't know it until the, <clears throat> one Monday, Thursday, when I invited Ted and Jamal to be a part of the service at, at my church in Seattle. 
And I read the text, mercifully read the text ahead of time and realized how hideous some of those stories are in blaming the Jews for the, for the death of Jesus. And so I changed some stuff. Um, and I didn't change any theological meaning. I changed uh, cultural meanings to make it possible for the three of us to participate in a moment that I, I'm glad we did, but I, it was merciful that I read the thing ahead of time. And that comes from the three of you relating together and the work that you've done. And I might just take a moment as we uh, continue our discussion here, saying some of the very basic elements that we've been talking about here are, are in a book that you've done called Religion Gone Astray, what we found at the heart of interfaith. And uh, we'll put that up on the screen, but that has some excellent passages and treatments of the uh, problem of uh, patriarchy. I might ask you, as we move from where we've been to where we need to go, if you could redefine the masculine ideal, where we need to be versus where we are, where we've been, how would each of you do that? First of all, I just wanted to uh, quickly uh, shed light on the womb of women, because it's a very critical point in Islamic spirituality. The point here is that if there was no womb of women, None of us would be. None of us would be here even talking about it. Okay. It really embodies and represents the creative principle uh, of, of really of godedness and goddessness. That, that was. I wanted to make that clear. So, uh, how how does one uh, de uh, redefine masculine ideal? Uh, you know, I'll take the case of the Prophet Muhammad as an example. He's considered mm -hmm. an ideal because he has a balance of male and, and female energy. Uh, in the time of Prophet Muhammad, it was always being attacked by superior forces. And the Quran says to Prophet Muhammad, defend yourself. You have to defend yourself for the sake of justice, for the sake of peace, for the sake of uh, uh, survival, until as the Quran says, war lays down its burden. But at the same time, the second most used word in the Quran after Allah is ilm, knowledge. So the Prophet Muhammad said, in this balance of male, female, uh, the Prophet Muhammad uttered, the ink of the scholar is more holy than the blood of the martyr. Third point, uh, you know, this again, a balance. We need compassion, we need kindness, we need mercy. Prophet Muhammad said, this is important to embody in one's life and know that if kindness, if compassion, if mercy, if gentleness was a thing of the created world, there's nothing in the world that could be more beautiful than this. This is again embodying the divine feminine in our um, uh, male masculine. Then uh, maybe just one more point, having empathy deep, profound empathy. Well, uh, just as an example, Prophet Muhammad was so despairing of the plight of slaves, he actually adopted a, a black slave as his own son. So these are just examples Muslim, Muslims give of really combining your uh, divine male energy and divine uh, female energy in really becoming a more developed, complete human being. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Jamal. I, I, yeah, I think that balance of feminine masculine en and feminine energy is crucial. Not just energy, but ways of understanding experience, sensibilities, um, because it would help men to, be, to learn to be more vulnerable and more comfortable with the kind of, uh, uh, the kind of thing that that helps you to understand how it feels to be the other. And the other, uh, in this case, for men would be, among other things, women, but anybody who's been marginalized, and in patriarchy, pretty much everybody is, except uh, at least in, in our culture, white men. So there's a porousness about vulnerability that is crucial. You know, I, I, I think I've expressed uh, 
on other occasions. Um, my discomfort thinking uh, that since I'm such, a, since I'm represent, I'm a representative of the problem. I I also have the answer. Um, and I strongly suspect I don't. So I'd like to have a much clearer, much more definite answer, but I strongly suspect the answer has to come in collaboration with women. Well, this thoughtful discussion, I think, helps us move along the road a couple of steps. We know it's a long journey ahead of us, but I thank you for providing some guidance and some direction and uh, appreciate both of you joining us on this program and also all of you watching and hope you'll join us again on next week's edition of Challenge 2.0. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this program, found our conversations to be informative, entertaining, and thought-provoking, and the vision inspiring of people from different backgrounds who can disagree without being disagreeable, perhaps you might consider supporting our program with a contribution. Your support will not only help our program continue, it will also support the broader efforts of Paths to Understanding, our supporting parent nonprofit organization.